Welcome everyone to another episode of the None of Our Businesses YouTube show and podcast, where we talk about recent news, business, taxes, accounting, all of that stuff. But we're talking about it, of course, from an accountant's perspective, actually multiple accountants perspectives. With me today is Charlie Zygmunt. Hi, everybody. Jack DiMatteo. Hello. And I'm Ty Carr. And what are we going to talk about today? Well, the BS jobs theory has been debunked. Flights are being canceled due to labor shortages. There's an irony there. Political party dedicated to anti-PowerPoint due to its impact on productivity. They even quantified it. And finally, Alaska gold mining, this is still a thing. All right, guys, let's get it going. We'll start off here today with Charlie. All right, so I've got an article we can talk about from the University of Cambridge called One in 20 Workers Are in Useless Jobs, which is far fewer than previously thought. And so apparently there's this idea going around called the, uh, part of my language, the bullshit jobs theory. And this was put out by an, anthro um, an American anthropologist named David Graeber, who is now, uh, di he died in September, but he had this theory that basically many people are in jobs that they don't actually value, or they don't really see the use of their job. And so they basically feel like what they do all day is bullshit. And he felt that up to from anywhere from 20 to 60% of the workforce, he felt would identify as having been in a bullshit jobs. But um, instead, there was a survey put out where basically a bunch of people were asked if they felt that they were providing value in their role. Or, and they pretty much took the results of that to compare to what his estimates were to say that actually only 5% of people think that they're in a bullshit job. Um, and so basically, I guess it, it, it talked about some interesting things. Uh, it said that certain fields were more likely to feel this than others. Talked about um, like teachers and nurses generally felt that they were doing something useful. And so there was a low rate there, but that like salespeople, it said, felt that they were more on the, um, on the side of feeling not as useful. Um, talked about like doorman and a couple of other positions, but I wanted to talk to you guys just about like for me personally, I've never worked a job where I, I guess maybe the first couple of jobs, but I never really worked a job where I felt it was useless because I didn't really apply to jobs that I thought had no purpose. And so I want to get your guys' take on if you felt that you've ever done any kind of what you would describe as a worthless job or if not, okay, well, why, why not? Uh, I think, yeah, I, I, well, what's interesting to me about this is uh, the way they did the survey. I mean, I wonder if they would have gotten dramatically different results if they asked how many people think their coworkers do bullshit jobs. <laughs> because, because, you know, when you asked the question you asked, Charlie, I was thinking about I'm like, well, of course, I don't think any job I've had was a bullshit job, but I've seen plenty of people in companies I've worked with that I thought had bullshit jobs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of an interesting, <laughs> I think there's an interesting dynamic there in terms of uh, self-awareness. The, the study is presuming a lot of self-awareness from people in, in, the way they're, in the way they're measuring whether there are people in bullshit jobs. Um, and uh, yeah, I think... You know, being in accounting, I mean, I think definitely I've had those moments where I feel like what I do is very meta. It's just very, like, very removed from the directness of what's important, uh, that there's a meaning to what I do, but it is, like, twice removed sometimes. And I, I definitely can feel that way often, that it's like, yeah, it's it, it doesn't have as much direct relationship sometimes to the, to the success of the, of the team or the, or the business I'm working with in, um, in an immediate way. Um, and, and so I've definitely had, had those feelings and, and thoughts rolling through my head at times, but I've always been able to rationalize that there is meaning to what I do. It's just, you have to kind of, you have to figure it out. You have to see the bigger picture. You have to see how it kind of connects and uh, to the relationships and to um, what else is going on. But yeah, I get that. That's me from, from my accountant's perspective anyway. Wow. This one's so much to talk about here. So little time. This, this one really kind of 
resonates with me. I, I, I mean, I guess I, it probably from, goes from starting out doing a lot of blue collar jobs and at a blue collar job, if you're not working, you're not going to be there very long. So if you're not doing something immediately, you feel like it's a BS job. So, uh, but now as I've, you know, grown and moved up, I guess, through the ranks and that, and I have talked to some people who are more senior roles, and if they're being completely honest with you, you know, they'll admit when they're really record, when their, their talents are really recorded, they're working very hard, but let's face it, there are Friday afternoons or, or slow times of the year when they're not exactly killing themselves. And if they're completely honest with you, they will admit that. Now, one of the things that I've often seen is, you know, the minute they have a downturn and, and, and I've gone into per- places as a consultant and you're kind of a little bit of a fly on the wall and you observe and you're like, not really sure what that one does all day, but they're here all day. And, you know, the minute that, what you notice is the minute that there's a downturn, they seem to be able to do rather severe staff reductions, but all that work that was there before still seems to get done. So I, I think when times are good, a lot of times companies will, you know, there is some fat baked into what they do at staffing, whether they, they, they won't admit that publicly. I'll, I'll guarantee you they won't admit that publicly, but I see it all the time. And I, and I kind of think that they, you know, nobody wants to work in that environment where you're, you know, you're, it's ni- 1956 and you're working 12 hours humped over a sewing machine or a, or a, or a machine doing, doing work. So, you know, there's almost a little bit of slack built in there. So I, I think that that's why it is everybody, nobody sees their job is not, uh, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah. If you ask if they thought their work, their coworkers was, but if you get people to admit it, uh, you know, there are some jobs out there that, and, and maybe, it's really a matter of there's 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 BS baked into a lot of jobs, but those people still do enough to where they don't feel they have a BS job. But th- this, no doubt in my mind, this is true. But I guess it's like again, it's all perspective, and for me, it kind of goes back to you know doing blue collar work. If you're not doing something, then you're not working, and I, I I find myself guilty of that now. It's a Friday afternoon, and I can't stop trying to do something because. I feel like I'm a piker trying to get over, but that's that's just my personality. Yeah, no, I'm with you 100%. And I think that, you know, it's important to note that all employment is voluntary. I mean, at, at least in this day and age and whatnot. And so if you're involved in a job that you think is worthless, you should go ahead and just not do that job um, because you're part of that decision. So, yeah, I, th- I just thought it was interesting. But, uh, yeah, do you have another article we can talk about, Jack? Yes, irony of ironies, right? So the business travel industry got absolutely crushed. So American Airlines is cutting flights because they can't find enough staff to work those flights. Now, a lot of different ways here. I mean, we've talked about it several times on this podcast about the labor shortages out there, but this one's kind of an interesting one for me because I work very closely to the business travel industry. I actually lost a long-term consulting engagement that was tied to the business travel industry. So you know, I think at one point I heard numbers like 90% of, of the business travel industry was laid off or reduced hours at one point in time. Well, you know, at, at what point do you start looking for other employment or, or exploring another field? So what this might, what this tells me is that a lot of those people, and it was interesting when I went to the training as a business broker, there were two people directly re, in, that were also in that program. The one was, it worked in with hotels her entire career and then she was in there trying to learn something different there was a pilot of all people who wasn't getting any flying hours so he was going to try his hand at being a business broker so I'm thinking a lot of the people that were in that industry have moved on to another profession and when all of a sudden we said hey masks off economies come roaring back you know we need flight attendants lo and be or or staff people that staff these planes Lo and behold, these people have moved on to other careers. You know, just it's just to me, I find it kind of ironic. We open things up again and you would think people would be dying to get back to work. But as it turns out, there's not enough people to uh, staff these flights. Yeah, I think it's um, I, I, it's unexpected. Right. We go through the we go through the uh, the whole shutdown of people not being able to fly due to the due to the recent events, due to recent events and. Um, and then you have to fly with masks on and you, you think all of that is what is going to curb flights and not, and, uh, uh, make it so that it's not as available for travel. And then, um, as our economy is opening up, you get this, right? It's like, oh, well, that's not even the issue anymore. We just don't have enough people to, <laughs> to make 
to, to make these trips happen. And so, um, yeah, I think there is a, there is an irony to that, right? There is an unfortunate irony to, and it, it's kind of reminds me similar of the other things that we've seen in other industries where they were affected during, they were affected over the last year. Um, they were on a roller coaster of not knowing how, th how things were going to go. Then it became clear that, well, the economy was still moving. They were still going to do okay. I'm thinking of like building and construction, for example, that we've talked about before. And then, and then, uh, things look like they're going to be okay. And then they have material shortages. So they, they have to deal with that and they can't necessarily, um, build at the level that, that they otherwise would. And so I think this is another variation of that same theme, right? You know, airlines going through, uh, dealing with all of the issues that we've had the last year. And, uh, and that certainly has hit their bottom lines. And then now things are opening up and their bottom line should be, should be great. They, and their opportunity for, uh, booking lots of, lots of trips and, and really getting, uh, really doing well as an airline. I mean, they should have, they could have really, they could have, I guess what I'm trying to say is airlines could have a really great year this year, right? With everything opening up, they could. Um, and yet now they have to deal with labor shortages. So yeah, I guess that the, the piece that I wonder at about it from as an accountant is what, if they're canceling flights because of labor shortages, um, what kind of fixed costs are they sitting on that are, you know, that they're not able to recover, right? I mean, is it is it a good thing? I mean, is it possible they actually have a really good profitable year because they're cramming more people into fewer flights at a higher cost? And so they're actually more profitable with doing less work, which I think is what other industries have started to see is that the shortages of, of their supply chain have actually helped them by driving up the market value of their goods and services and allow them to just generate a higher profit off doing less work or selling less things. And I think, I think the same thing could be true here, but I, but it of course would depend on, well, what kind of fixed cost are they sitting on uh, by not operating more flights kind of thing. So yeah, th those are some of my ramblings. No, I think that makes total sense. Like you have to compare it that way. And I think it's also kind of like another question that I would be thinking if I were in the airline field was, uh, to what extent can we solve this problem by raising wages? Because I mean, on the one hand, everything is, you know, people are signing up for jobs based on who's paying. And so I think that if your issue is that you have not enough people in those seats, um, that might be one way to approach it. And how does that compare to the loss of, of all the gross profit from those flights that would have happened had those people been um, working? And so, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. And the only other thing I thought to um, kind of note here is that so often when the economy goes up or down, we're focused on like how much did it go up or down. But then a lot of times there's just restructuring that's going on behind the scenes of people moving industries to one field or another. And so even when we don't maybe see a big net change in how the economy as a whole is doing, it just restructuring away from travel causes these kinds of issues that we're seeing. And so I think that some of this is, um, is, is, you know, that issue happening and it'd be interesting to kind of see how that plays out. If we see a mass influx of people then coming to fill those roles, or if the travel industry just scales down and stays at that level. Um, so yeah, we'll see as, as things go on. Um, yeah, but I've got another article we can go into if you guys are ready to move on. So uh, in Wikipedia, the, you know, the most legitimate of all sources, I found a article called Anti-PowerPoint Party. And now what this is, is a group of people, a Swiss political party dedicated to decreasing the professional use of Microsoft PowerPoint, which they claim costs, causes national economic damage amounting to 2.3 billion USD and lowers the quality of presentation in 95% of the cases. They say that instead of PowerPoint, what is the big answer? Flip charts, papers that you turn over, you write on them, right? You make your PowerPoint and then you turn the page you sort of flip it to the next page. And, um, and that would then solve everything. And then we would sort of just have that 2.3 billion back if we were just using flip charts. And that's the, that's the stance that they're taking. Um, it was a, a motion that was put together by a software engineer and a footballer. 
And so, uh, yeah, I want to get your guys' take on whether or not you feel that uh, it is PowerPoint causing economic damage. Is that embellishment, or uh, what do you what do you guys think? I guess everybody's entitled to their opinion on this one, but you know, I just I, I just see PowerPoint as an effective, useful tool. I mean, I know you know we've all been bludgeoned and sat in those meetings where people go through with the PowerPoint, but I think it's you know to sit there and suggest that a flip chart is better. I mean, with especially now at this age of Zoom and things like that. Good luck with your flip chart. Uh, but I, like I say, I think, I, think, I think Zoom, you know, it's almost like who hasn't sat in those meetings where you brainstorm and they got sticky notes all over the walls and stuff. I mean, that, if they, that's more annoying to me than, than PowerPoint. So I, I can say, I just think it's a useful thing. I can, I can definitely see where, you know, you go, to a, you go to an out of town summit or something for four or five days and you sit through four or five, PowerPoint presentations a, a day it can get to be a little bit much, but I think you know on balance it's it's a it's it's a very useful tool and a, and a great way to make a presentation and dispense a lot of information and I mean and then and a lot of times you know the people who attend those meetings that becomes your takeaway everybody hey can I can I have a can I have a copy of that PowerPoint presentation and that's something they can take with them so uh, like I say I guess if there's a, many things in corporate America that are going to make me irate I don't think PowerPoint tops the list. Yeah, it's interesting that I, I guess the the other thing I would say is great about PowerPoint is that you know if you're creating a good if you're creating a good presentation and it's particularly if it's technical in nature, then the PowerPoint itself can become a resource, right? So it'd be so you know, and that's that's hard to turn the the flip chart into a resource for everybody. Um, I suppose you could be recording it in some way, but I mean, I also. It's interesting, you know, when you make that comparison of a flip chart to cap PowerPoint, because at first, you know, at first blush, it just sounds like, oh, well, you're doing a manual version of PowerPoint. So how could that be better? Right. But I think that it's um, I, I, I suspect that uh, that it might also change behavior in terms of how how the presentation is delivered and, and, and how much they're relying on the flip chart versus how much when people deliver a PowerPoint, they rely on more of a pre-canned presentation typically. And it takes me back to when I used to, when I used to teach at the university, because um, most, most of my colleagues would teach from PowerPoints. And in fact, textbook authors would provide pre-canned PowerPoints that you could adopt for your classes and then kind of modify to your needs and then present. And that's what a lot of faculty would do. Um, and I'm sure still do in some in some fashion, although over this last year, I think there's been a lot of reimagining of how to deliver educational content because people aren't necessarily doing it in the classroom. But um, what I, what I, what I, I never would use PowerPoint in the classroom. I would, I wouldn't use a flip chart. But I guess what I used was similar. I used the whiteboard um, in terms of writing things on the board as I go. And what I found is that it prevent the reason for that was behavioral. You know, I was basically preventing myself from going too fast or delivering something that was pre-canned uh, and that I was just kind of reading from it, so to speak, because as I, you know, I was an accounting faculty. So in delivering what I would deliver, I'd be discussing concepts, but also working through examples and working through story problems and things of that nature. And I had to work the problem on the board. You know, it wasn't it wasn't like I was it wasn't like I was walking somebody through a solution in PowerPoint. I was actually deriving the solution in front of everybody. Uh, you know, I was doing the work, sweating in front of them, or at least they thought that's what I was doing. You know, I taught several classes a day. Each class would have sixty to seventy people in it, so. And then I would teach the same course, multi, you know, three terms a year, three quarters a year. So frankly, obviously, but it, it was to some extent recorded in my brain and I was acting out a script that I had done many times before. But even so, I think it still slowed me down a bit compared to what I would have done if I was just flipping through a PowerPoint deck. And it created at least this illusion that we were working through the problem, working through the discussion together. And it wasn't just me delivering pre-canned content. Um, and, and, I, I, and I always felt that illusion in that kind of interaction with the class was important. 
Um, so, so yeah, that's my, that's my insight of it, on it from my, from my old lecturing days. No, I think that makes sense. And just to kind of add on it, it's like the PowerPoint's a medium. So it's like saying paper is boring. Well, it's like, well, you put boring stuff on paper, then that's going to be a boring paper. But if you can put something exciting together, it can happen in PowerPoint. It can happen in wherever it's more about what is the actual content. Um, so yeah. Uh, do you have another article we can talk about, Jack? Yeah, it's the uh, kind of kind of a little bit of a play on what we were talking about last week with people going to Texas, and we've been talking about raping and pillaging the land a little bit. Well, this one's a little bit different. This one comes from Alaska, so I guess they've discovered an opportunity to set up a gold mine. It would create 220 jobs in the local economy, another 40 for contractors, and in a town that has a population of, I believe, it was 1,853 people that could have a pretty significant impact. Now, the downside to it all is it's going to interrupt the Chinook or the King Salmon stream, if you will, uh, you know, their migration patterns. And so now there's locals and some local Native, Native Americans that then and, and, and local, this local population that's, that's kind of against that. So it's the old uh, Davy versus, you know, what's, you know, the progress versus, you know, maintaining what you have. And I know, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, Alaska, you know, compared to the rest of the country, a lot of it is untapped wilderness still to this point. One of the reasons is because it's probably dark half the year and cold all of the time. So uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of penetration in there to begin with, but, but this is one of those ones they want to keep kind of sacrosanct. And, and I can see the argument on both, both sides. I don't live there, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to land on either side, but I was curious to see uh, what you guys thought of the article. Well, I would, I would just say, you know, wow, gold mining in Alaska, this is, this is still a thing, right? It's like, you know, I, yeah, of course people are gold mining somewhere. Right. So of course it would be a thing and uh, at least somewhere in the world. And yeah, I think to me that that's just what I found kind of fascinating was more just the, the concept of this, is this is a profession. This is a, this is a uh, venture that people are getting into and, and that still create, and it creates, uh, conflict in the modern day. Um, I don't, I like you, I don't have much in a, of an opinion about that um, in terms of the conflict that it creates. I, I just enjoyed the, uh, just uh, reminding myself of kind of a, a very old and uh, tried and true uh, way to kind of seek your to seek your fortunes, right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think anytime we have some kind of like resource that is in a place where there's also all this wildlife, we have to ask ourselves this question of, is it worth, you know, destroying that for the benefit that it brings? Now, in some cases, it's easy because we're talking about things maybe that have value, but are not really meaningful, like a diamond, for example, right? We all look at a diamond and it has this value, but we also know that that value is propped up by marketing essentially, whereas gold at least has applications and semiconductors and maybe some more legitimate things. So I think depending on what the resource we're talking about is versus the damage that it does would be how I would sort of think my way through this. Um, in this case, it's a better argument than a lot of, a lot of the others, but the flip side is there is also ANWR, the Alaskan National Wildlife uh, Refuge. And so I think in, to some extent, there's been some boundaries set up. And I would ask if that was, you know, if this was part of that, or if not, if there had been some reason, because it feels like that was the attempt to establish um, a clear untapped area of Alaska to not have this issue in. Um, so that's how I look at it. I have no real way of knowing if this really makes sense, but it does seem like the more and more that we see global warming and, you know, we're about to have all these temperatures that are going to be crazy, which is a different issue, but I feel like it's all signs to kind of step back and be humble about our role in the environment and maybe just like not kill all the salmon for a minute and just breathe in and get through a cycle and then we can talk about, you know, mining all the gold later, but it's like, let's exist for a year first and then we can. So that, that's my speech. I tried to save the salmon. I love it. Well, yeah, let's just exist for a year and then, yeah. and then get back yeah. to capital. I like your take. Uh, uh, yeah. Who, who would still, who would have thunk it in 2021? There was gold in them, our hills. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm watching an old Western or something. Yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that you'd see people out there paying it. Well, I'm sure they probably 
that's probably the other argument. I'm sure they're out there strip mining. They're not sitting there panning with uh, gently panning with with for, for gold. They're probably strip mining and blasting the hell out of the landscape, which is why can people complain. So interesting. As much as, much as some things change, they stay the same. All right, everybody. That's been our show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. This has been the None of Our Businesses YouTube show and podcast. Please tune in again next week for more business updates from an accountant's perspective. Also, please check out our sister podcast, Profitless on Purpose, where they discuss anything and everything relating to the nonprofit space. Thanks again. See you again next week.